Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Africa Week. This session is on reclaiming and repatriating African heritage. It is our pleasure to welcome you here to the virtual University of Michigan. And I would like to just start by admitting that we struggled a little bit with the title of our panel because the R words mean a lot of different things to different people. Um, when we think about repatriation, we often think about return, we think about restoration, sometimes we think about reparations, but what does this actually mean? And so that is part of what we are going to be discussing today. I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, we have a distinguished group of people from around uh, University of Michigan and from Africa. And I will start by introducing uh, Chow Tayana Maina. She is a Kenyan digital heritage specialist and digital humanities scholar working at the intersection of culture and technology. Her work primarily focuses on the application of technology within African culture and heritage. She is the founder of African Digital Heritage, a co-founder of the Museum of British Colonialism, and a co-founder of the Open Restitution Africa Project. All of the resources that I've just mentioned are online resources and, and initiatives seeking to encourage a more critical, holistic, and knowledge-based approach to the design and implementation of digital solutions within African cultural heritage. Welcome, Chao Maina. Um, next, we have uh, Professor Dr. Derek Peterson. He is a professor of history and African studies at the University of Michigan. He is the author or editor of several books, including The Unseen Archive of Idi Amin, Photographs from the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation, which was published this month. Peterson was awarded the MacArthur Genius Award in 2017. So I don't know about the rest of you, but now I'm really scared. So when I read that, I thought, I, I'm in the company of a genius. So the rest of us will just have to play along. For the past 10 years, Dr. Peterson has been working with Ugandan colleagues and U of Michigan students to organize, digitize, and circulate endangered archival materials. Thank you, Dr. Peterson, and welcome. Next, we also have Dr. Kelly Askew. She is Professor of Anthropology and Afro-American and African Studies at the University of Michigan. She is author of Performing the Nation, Swahili Music and Cultural Politics in Tanzania, and co-director of the award-winning documentary film Maasai Remix. She received her PhD in anthropology from Harvard University. Welcome, Dr. Askew. We also have Dr. Paul Conway. He is a recently retired associate professor from U of M School of Information. His research and teaching interests encompass the digitization of cultural heritage resources with a special focus on the complexities presented by audio and visual archives. Dr. Conway received his PhD in Library and Information Studies from the U of M. He is now Associate Professor Emeritus in the University of Michigan School of Information. His research and teaching have focused on archival science, digitization, and preservation of cultural heritage resources, and the ethics of new information technologies. His funded research projects at U of M have included developing a model of expert user interaction with large collections of digitized photographs, measuring the quality of large scale digitization as represented in the Hathi Trust Digital Library and understanding the complexities of providing digital access to collections of original live audio, uh, audio recordings, including the extensive recordings in the Leo Sarkeesian Music Time in Africa archive. I will stop there. Everyone has long and distinguished Bio, uh, biographies. So let me introduce our final panelist and welcome Dr. Conway. Uh, our last final panelist that I will introduce is Dr. Sir, Siraj Rasool. He is a senior professor of history at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. He also teaches museum and heritage studies 
and, and cura curatorship. Among his latest publications are The Politics of Heritage in Africa, Economies, Histories, and Infrastructures, co-edited with his panelist, Dr. Derek Peterson, and Kadzo Gavua. Um, he's also published the um, Rethinking Empire in Southern Africa, which was co-edited with Dag Henriksen, Giorgio Meischer, and Lorena Rizzo. Um, finally, he has also published most recently, um, more recently, uh, a publication called Missing and Missed, Subject, Politics, Memorialization. I'm having trouble speaking this morning, apparently. Um, Co-edited with Nikki Rousseau and Ridvan Musaj. He has served on the boards of the District 6 Museum and Iziko Museums of South Africa, as well as on the Human Remains Advisory Committee of the Minister of Arts and Culture. He has previously chaired the Scientific Committee of the International Council of African Museums and is a member of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Study of Physical Anthropology Collection, Felix van Luchan, at the Stachlich Museen zu Berlin, Germany. Apologies for any mispronunciations. So welcome to all of our panelists. Um, it is a pleasure that um, I am back at the University of Michigan where I did my undergraduate uh, degree in English uh, language and literature in the school of LSNA and uh, went on to get my uh, Juris Doctor. And um, it's just a pleasure to be speaking and working on Africa with these distinguished colleagues. So for our first set of comments, I would like to turn to Dr. Siraj Rasool. Siraj, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. It's a great pleasure to be uh, on this panel um, this evening for me in Korea, I talk from Cape Town. Um, and over the last 20 years or so, uh, as part of my research on histories of collecting um, and on projects that seek to democratize museums in a society such as South Africa, which has been a kind of laboratory of uh, transformation. Um, I've gotten to do research on restitution. Um, and this took me to understanding the history of human remains collecting in the Northern Cape and in the transfrontier region between South Africa, Botswana, and Namibia that were really the first collections in the modern museum in South Africa. And these were uh, illegally, unethically acquired human remains of bodies of Khoisan people that were disinterred, excavated from their graves, and taken into museums. Um, and this, uh, uh, this research led to a book that got published many years ago uh, called Skeletons in the Cupboard that I did with my late colleague, Martin Legasic, and that has gone on to have new life. In 2012, the findings of this book led to a restitution of the uh, skeletons of Klaas and Troy Pina to be reburied at Kuruman near where their, their corpses had been excavated from by the assistant to the Austrian uh, physical anthropologist Rudolf Perch. And as a result of that research... Dr. 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 Rasul, let, let me uh, just stop you for one second. Maybe just for our audience, you could describe who um, who this person is and why is it's, why is his remains why are his remains so significant? Okay, these, these remains were significant because um, they were part of a, a series of skeletons and corpses that were disinterred at the time for the purposes of racial study. Uh, this was the time when South Africa was becoming a nation and South African museums and scientists were laying prior claim to having access to these remains. And as a result of that competition that South African scientists had with the Euro their European counterparts, we have an archive of this history of collecting and where we can see the origins of 
the modern museum in South Africa, we can see the, the history of the South Africanization of science. And where um, what, what was also significant about uh, the remains of class in Troy Pinar was that we were able to name the dead from, uh, from the records of an inquiry. And not only that, we were able to ascertain that they were a married couple of farm workers on a farm Pinar Spitz, where they had passed away of malarial fever. And at a time in, uh, after the ending of apartheid, when you are transforming museums, when you are rethinking you, yourself as a nation, dead bodies have featured very strongly in the ways in which societies have reconfigured themselves. We only need to think about the war dead of the First World War. Um, we need to think of the cemeteries of the dead and where the dead lies and how national narratives come to pertain to different categories of the dead. And the dead of racial science and are part of the process of deracializing and democratizing South African society. And the restitution that took place occurred through a methodology that the South Africans described as rehumanization. But one of the first times in the world that this took place because our, our Austrian counterparts in the state and in the museum declared when this demand was put on the table by the South Africans, that that would not be possible under European law, that whatever is to be found in a museum has been rendered as an object, and as objects shall they be returned. And it was the, through the sheer skill of diplomacy that this restitution occurred as a rehumanization. And that idea of rehumanization has been pivotal and has gone on to influence returns elsewhere. And so my work has gone on to assist our German colleagues in their returns, in their debates through which science presents itself as being able to tell history from bones and want to hold on to the remains of, 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 of the dead, of the colonial dead of racial science. And so the Germans have moved forward in many ways and are in the middle of a return of the remains of, uh, of, of people um, collected by a research expedition uh, uh, from Rwanda. So there, there is a return of remains uh, that had been collected by a Polish scientist by the name of Czekanowski that are being returned to Rwanda. Finally, I want to make one very important point, and this is in the light of the rise of the restitution debate in the last few years since the publication of the Saar Savoir report in 2017 to Emmanuel Macron, since the publication a few months ago of the book, The Brutish Museums by my colleague, uh, Dan Hicks of Pitt Rivers Museum that establishes the extent to which museums were embedded in projects of, uh, of colonial conquest, of expeditions of conquest, that museums are not, were not just beneficiaries of conquest. Um, museums are brutal institutions and that have created an aura and an ideology of care and, and uh, humaneness. And it is very important for us to remember that human remains and material culture were collected as part of the very same expeditions. The very same researchers collected human remains, made sound recordings, uh, made film recordings. And so we need to think of these different categories of collections, if you like, in the same breath, because we are at a stage of rethinking what we mean by museum. Museums have to be placed on, on, on a, a platform for a, an, an ethics of a new humanity. Thank you very much, Dr. Rasul. I think what you have said um, about the, what the meaning of a museum is and rethinking a museum 
um, as part and parcel of the brutal conquest, uh, the colonial conquest, um, and the racialization of, uh, of human remains. And um, I particularly appreciated your comments about restitution occurring through the rehumanization. And part of the success that you mentioned was diplomacy, which is my business. And so um, I think that this provides us with a, a way to link some of the work that all of you are doing and what diplomats can do in also furthering this cause. And I think we'll see this thread throughout the comments and we'll pick up on some of this uh, during the panel discussion. So thank you very much. Um, next, I would like to turn to um, Dr. Derek Peterson, who uh, has also been working on digitization uh, of the archives in Uganda. So Dr. Peterson, over to you. Right. Um, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have an opportunity to talk to this distinguished group of folks, some of whom are my colleagues, others of whom I very much have learned from over the course of time. I want to talk in a brief period of time here about work in which I've been engaged with Ugandan students and colleagues and with Michigan students and colleagues uh, involving the rehumanization, as it were, of endangered government records in Uganda, in East Africa. In the late 2000s, that is in 2008-09, I started to work with a provincial university in Western Uganda called Mountains of the Moon University to address what seemed to us to be the pressing problem to do with preserving government records in the Western part of the Republic of Uganda. This is the uh, Kabadole District Archive, which was kept in the attic above the local government building. We started by bringing it and other district government archives into the campus of Mountains of the Moon University, which is located in Fort Portal in Western Uganda. The archives were cleaned up, put into order uh, in a logical way. And then over the course of years, they were digitized um, using funds from the Center for Research Library, the Cooperative Africana Materials Project, and from the University of Michigan with lots of resource also from MMU itself. Over the course of time, MMU has created a digital archive which consists of some 500,000 individual scans, making it the largest digitized repository of government documents in Africa. Access to that archive is only available to people who go to MMU in Western Uganda to consult it on a desktop computer. Alongside this work, I've been also collaborating with a number of provincial universities in Uganda uh, to help uh, organize uh, paper archives in district government headquarters. So in 2013, we worked with Kabale University to organize the Kabale District Archive. In 2015, we worked with Busoga University in Eastern Uganda to rescue the Jinja District Archive, which was underwater at the time we arrived. We brought the files above ground, dried them out and put everything in order, creating a catalog for the collection this catalog and the whole collection is now available for research at the Uganda National Archives in Kampala. Most recently, I've been working with uh, the judiciary of Uganda and with a number of Michigan students to organize and digitize the archives of Uganda's judiciary. We began working with the judiciary in 2018 uh, to put in order its very extensive collection of case files and legal notes which have been uh, previously inaccessible both to court clerks, to litigants, and to researchers. The files were brought above to a working, group, working room, which you can see on the screen here, uh, placed in order. The archives of the High Court of Uganda have now been organized and we're working uh, alongside Uganda uh, um, archivists to render other collections accessible as well um, for researchers and students to use. Right at the moment, I'm working with colleagues at the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation to make accessible their very extensive collection of photographic, film, and radio materials. The UBC photo archive itself is kind of a wonder. It consists of some 70,000 photographic negatives made by government photographers in the 1950s through to the 1990s. Thus far, we've digitized some 40,000 out of those negatives uh, the most recent stage of this project just ended 
a few months ago when we digitized materials from the 80s and 90s. Um, alongside this work, we've also been working with the radio archive and with the film archive to render endangered material that is decaying material into different formats where it can be accessible and used in programming at UBC and for international broadcasting. Um, some of this material was put on display in a museum exhibition, which myself and my colleagues opened up at the Uganda Museum in May 2019. This exhibition was called The Unseen Archive of Idi Amin. It featured about 150 of the photographs which we had digitized from the UBC alongside a selection of photographic, of film rather, and radio material, which we made available in the exhibition hall. The exhibition was on show for uh, something close to 10 months and thereafter we took it around to other parts of Uganda where it was accessible for other Ugandan audiences to see. Um, the uh, exhibition has been a great success in helping to promote discussion around Idi Amin's Uganda, a subject which has been largely closed for historical research and for political uh, reflection in contemporary Uganda. Most recently, as uh, Ambassador Page mentioned, myself and my colleague from Australia have edited a collection of these photographs and made them available as a book titled The Unseen, Unseen Archive of Idi Amin. All of us involved in this work see it really as a means of making uh, accessible materials that have been closed, of opening up conversations that have been in some sense shut off prematurely, of furnishing Ugandan citizens and researchers and students with materials with which to inquire into a past that's been in some sense inaccessible because of its uh, the character of the material itself and also because of the nature of Ugandan politics today in which uh, current, uh, the current regime has been disposed against historical reflection altogether. Historical and archival uh, work, in other words, is always political. It, um, is a means of status, challenging a status quo. It's a means of empowering minority voices. It's a way of making possible futures in some sense actionable and visible. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Peterson, I think just the visual uh, for me is, um, is the visual for me was, was so powerful. And I think this is another connection between um, the humanization as well as um, the historical reflection, the memorialization that uh, Dr. Rasul talked about as well. Um, and I, it, it's also a, a way that we um, can, can think about different narratives and um, who owns the narrative. And speaking of the ownership, I know that this has been a, a long discussion uh, about the archives in different contexts, not just in Uganda, um, but elsewhere. And uh, I think that that's something that is a, a recurring question about even the accessibility of some of the archives that you, that you mentioned, um, only being available at one university in Uganda uh, to those who know about it and can have access once they're there. Um, and what does that mean for others who would like to know more about um, the Ugandan government at that time? So um, this is going to be yet another discussion um, and, and another theme that we're going to be talking about, especially as we turn next to Dr. Kelly Eskew and uh, Dr. Paul Conway who will talk about the digitizing of the Voice of America project uh, that they have been collaborating on. So I turn it over to you two. Thank you very much, Master Page. Yes, we're gonna move now from the realm of sight to yes. the realm of sound. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, to introduce the work that we're doing with the Leo Sarkeesian archive and its rare African music recordings that we believe deserve international access and appreciation not to be left abandoned and forgotten in a government storage facility. Paul, my, co my colleague, Paul Conway and I will introduce the collection and say a few words about how our work relates to the challenges of restitution and repatriation of African heritage resources using digital technologies. 
Leo Sarkeesian, the man behind the Voice of America's show Music Time in Africa, had a big personality, a love for all forms of music and dance, and a, and a passion for introducing African music to listeners throughout the world. A decorated World War II veteran of Armenian descent, Leo spent over a decade as a sound engineer first with Tempo Records, a Hollywood-based um, production company that trained him to produce field recordings of music intended for film soundscapes. But then starting in 1958, he was started traveling, Leo with his wife, Mary, through over 38 countries of then becoming newly independent African nations, creating a unique and rich collection of over 300 live field recordings. In 1963, legendary broadcaster Edward R. Murrow recruited Leo to join the Voice of America, the official broadcast agency of the United States government. Murrow charged Leo to help support radio stations in newly independent African nations. He trained African sound engineers, facilitating African initiated music collection and archiving that continues to the present day. Leo always collaborated with local musical experts such as El Hajj Siddiqui Diabate in Guinea, one of the most famous griots of the modern era, and Bai T. Moore, an assistant minister in the Liberian Ministry of Culture and founder of Liberia's National Cultural Center. In the collection are the first known recordings of Nigeria's Fela Kuti and Guinea's Bambea Jazz, and the only known recording of Louis Armstrong performing in Africa at the 1967 Tunis Festival. Leo's fieldwork, his radio program, and his efforts to support the decolonization of African airwaves constituted a critical component of the Voice of America's communication strategy, simultaneously advancing the causes of African independence and also American political influence. In recent decades, scholars have attempted to grapple with and respond to the inequities and ethical dilemmas surrounding large collections of sound recordings that were taken, removed, and disappeared from local settings and collected, preserved, and hidden in archives far from their originating communities. These images on this slide show some of the efforts ongoing to return digitized recordings via community outreach, local performances, and even USB drives. However, barriers derive from the machine dependency of sound recordings in communities without reliable electricity, ICT infrastructure, and access to the internet. Music Time in Africa is the longest and uh, running and most popular radio show from The Voice of America. The first broadcast of Music Time in Africa was in May 1965 from Monrovia, Liberia. The timing of the 30 minute weekly program attracted listeners across sub-Saharan Africa just prior to a major two hour news broadcast on Sunday evenings called African Panorama. Music Time in Africa was and continues to be a highly choreographed and fully scripted performance of intertwined words and music. Beginning with the first program, Leo assembled musical selections by string together recordings drawn from the extensive collections in the program's music library, some 10,000 uh, uh, tapes and uh, recordings of all in all media. Uh, Leo uh, worked exclusively with quarter inch uh, magnetic tape, ripping selections from 45 RPM singles or LPs. He also extracted excerpts from his live field recordings and from the recordings sent to him by radio stations in Africa. A series of very talented and increasingly popular announcers performed the scripts around selections cut into the program at specifically timed intervals. The hosts projected a, a personal interest in the listener experience while crediting Leo Sarkeesian for the intellectual content. The show's messaging has always been immensely popular with African audiences as evidenced by the nearly 1000 fan letters that the show received every month. Leo and his wife, Mary, faithfully responded to most of these letters for four decades, enclosing signed photographs, calendars, and program schedules. 
Host Rita Rochelle inspired at least one fan club in Nigeria, and she traveled with Leo in Africa in the 1980s on several uh, of his many return visits. The project website for Music Time in Africa, the, uh, the uh, URL for which is uh, below in this slide, um, includes a custom built online platform that by, uh, by later this year will provide direct access to nearly 1,100 radio shows, as well as faceted metadata browsing and full text search of program scripts. For the first 30 years of the show, broadcast from um, the, the first 30 years, broadcast from 1966 to 1996, are available now through this interface. Plans for this year include releasing broadcasts from 2000 to 2017 and the majority of Leo's 360 original field recordings. The fundamental challenge in repatriating recordings of radio broadcasts is the borderless disembodied nature of radio itself. Much of the material included in Music Time in Africa is orphaned in the ontological, if not the legal sense of the term. For this project, our approach is to return or repatriate African music to Africa through rebroadcasting Music Time in Africa through the open internet and by collaborating with the Voice of America to reach the vast current audience of the radio show. Uh, more than a, a, a million listeners um, have a, a log um, Music Time in Africa through various media right now. It's still an active program. Um, as a safety measure, we're prepared to use well-established takedown procedures developed at the University of Michigan to respond to situations where resistance arises from releasing individual musical selections. So that's our presentation for today. Um, thank you for joining us. And um, we look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Eskew and, and Dr. Conway. Um, this is really an interesting uh, notion of repatriation through rebroadcast. And I know that we've touched on some of the legal issues um, about what that means and how to go about that, that will, is going to be an ongoing um, issue. I think uh, the rights of the original artists and their uh, descendants, uh, along with the rights of the broadcaster themselves, um, but this is where I think we can have a very good transition to uh, Chao Maina because she will talk about the significance of the data and uh, what we can do with that. So I will turn it over to, uh, to Chao Maina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Susan. It's a wonderful pleasure to be here with, with you today and to speak alongside uh, such fantastic projects. And um, Today I'll be speaking about Open Restitution Africa, which is a project uh, started by my colleague Molemo and I. And it's an Africa-led project seeking to open up access to information on the restitution of African material culture and human ancestors with the aim of empowering all stakeholders to make knowledge-based decisions. So I've talked about what the project is, but why do we need this project? And I'll briefly speak about how we started it. Uh, my colleague Molemo and I met at a conference uh, in 2019 in Namibia, and this conference brought together African practitioners working within museums particularly, and some who are working within restitution. And we were both very encouraged to see um, and hear about what's happening in Namibia, in South Africa, in Angola. But what we also noticed is that this data and this information was largely invisible. So therefore it seemed like a lot was happening, but when you look online, when you try to find data, when you try to understand who is working on what, it was very hard to find this information. And this really became the impulse for Open Institution Africa. Um, this being uh, the, the lack of information available to African practitioners or interested parties who want to work on restitution, whether it's within debates, policy and practice. And because of this lack of data, it's very difficult for us to observe trends, to understand shifts, to understand what's happening, but also to enable more people to operate from a place of knowledge. And the other thing about the lack of data is, and this lack of visibility, particularly of, of um, African practitioners, is that the debate seems that it's, it's largely dominated by European voices. So the project in essence seeks to remedy this lack of representation of African voices by enabling um, a very in-depth and data-driven debate on restitution for Africans by Africans. And in this way, uh, particularly 
being very deliberate about highlighting the experience, complexities, and needs of African practitioners. And to speak particularly on the issue of complexities, I think one of the things that's come up a lot when we're doing this project is the issue of um, that African practitioners are dealing with much more than just the act or return or, or the process of restitution itself. You know, this, there's a lot of emotional labor involved, psychological, intellectual labor, there's politics, there's hierarchical relationships that we're dealing with. And just to use the words of Njoki Ngumi, who is a Kenyan practitioner, she says that we have to accept that our unrest is valid and we should pay attention to it. So the complexities in essence are a big part of the process. And while it, it might seem that, you know, European practitioners can treat restitution as a nine to five job, for many African practitioners, this is a lived experience, you know, separating restitution from your lived experience as a child or as, a, as an adult in your country and how you engage with your culture is nearly impossible. So what does open restitution look like practically? Uh, the project seeks to gather data on restitution, current restitution processes across the African continent, um, and serve as a sort of like a centralized portal of case studies and best practice examples, and therefore encourage, as I had mentioned, a data-informed and very in-depth conversation. So some of the things we want to map out in terms of digital data are things like completed returns, what's pending, what's best practice, um, what's, what are the policy and advocacy uh, approaches towards restitution on the continent, but also have something like a specialist or restitution practitioner centralized database. So if you're looking for someone who's working on restitution in Angola, you should be able to find it. If you're looking for what's happening in Kenya or people to talk to, you should be able to, to have access to that. And I think the other thing is um, when we talk about opening up this data on restitution, it's not just about facts and figures. The way we envision it essentially is that opening up this data is also about the human data, the human experience and, and the experiences of African practitioners. And to this, to this end, we've been hosting a series of public discussions and public webinars called Restitution Dialogues in a way that we are trying to make this as, as accessible um, to both specialist and non-specialist audiences. And I think um, when I reference one of the one of the webinars we had, we spoke to El Haj Malik Yai from Senegal. And he said that sometimes it feels like we're moving in circles. We keep asking the same questions and addressing the same issues. And therefore we we're not able to understand the progress or measure it in whether it's metric or qualitative terms. So the project is essentially um, grounded on research. It's, it's an experiment, as I said, um, and where we have two strands of research. There's restitution research, uh, focusing on restitution data, and then there's open data research. Uh, some of the research questions we have are, uh, what kind of data do African practitioners need? What are they currently relying on to drive restitution requests? In what ways do these current sources of data strengthen or impede the restitution process? What kind of data or information would be of value to institutions and practitioners, particularly those involved within the restitution projects? And what are some of the viable um, digital systems or strategies for centralizing and sharing um, this data on restitution? So lastly, and I think just to speak to the issue of, of it being a public discussion, I think open restitution, both uh, my colleague and I truly believe that Open restitution is committed to the principle that more transparency and openness uh, and access to information in clear, easy to understand language can enable a more nuanced discussion among different, different stakeholders within the restitution debate, whether it's public audiences or museum practitioners or policymakers. Um, just to look at some of the data that we've had from our webinar series online, in six months we had almost 2,000 views. But what was interesting was that over 80% of the audience was between 25 to 35 and 78% of the audience were women. And I think this speaks largely to, to um, restitution also and, and the groundwork of this, of, of this cultural work being done mostly by women, whereas higher, when, the higher you go, it's, it's uh, more male-centric. So open restitution, for, it, it really is a, an, an approach and allowing us to define both in contemporary times what restitution means to us as a younger generation of Africans, but also as people who want to unpack 
the cultural and hierarchical emotional power complexities that African practitioners have to face every day when dealing within this subject. And we keep saying that it's a, it's a reality that we live in. It's an everyday experience. Restitution is not something that we, we choose to cast aside. It informs so many of our decisions and how we move and engage with our culture. So we understand uh, essentially and look at op op um, restitution as an opportunity and um, the belief and an attempt to open up this data in, and encourage a more critical understanding of what it means to change how we see museums as, as Siraj spoke about this being a chance to really redefine and question what museums represent and how they are founded in terms of ethics and rehumanization, but also the point that data is a crucial part of this discussion and the availability and accessibility of data is very crucial. So thank you very much and yeah, looking forward to, to questions. Thank you very much. Um, so I think everyone can see that we have a fantastic group of panelists who have immense experience in uh, data collection, digitization, and restitution. I would like to focus our conversation to get started on the idea of what a museum is and how do museums, um, how can they both hold onto um, ideas of the past or um, serve as evidence of the past and how at the same time can those voices that are often unheard, uh, the lived experiences as, as Chao Maina spoke about and, uh, and Dr. Rasul, how, how do we get those voices out there? It's not that they're not there, we, we know that. Um, we know that Africa has the youngest population of all the, of the continents right now. Um, and there's clearly a hunger just from what you're saying about the number of people who attended the, re the restitution dialogues, the webinars and whatnot, especially with uh, the number of women. But how do we make it um, so that the lived experiences are not re-traumatizing and how should we start thinking what is the current thought about remaking of a museum? So maybe I'll, I'll turn first to Siraj, but I, I, I do want this to be a conversation between all of you. So um, Dr. Rasul, why don't you kick us off? And, um, and maybe uh, Ms. Maina, you can then uh, comment because you've been working on these different museums as a co-founder um, and, and what that means from your perspective. So Dr. Rasul. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Page, and thank you very much to all my co-panelists for their presentations. Um, we are very um, honored. It's, it's, it's an enormous privilege for us to be living at a very peculiar time in the transformation of what we mean by museum. Uh, we, we are the products of and we live inside of the museum as a regulatory institution of governmentality that regulates the relationship between uh, things and people. But the museum also came into existence uh, at a time that coincided with colonization. So the museum came into existence not just as a collecting institution, but as, as, as an epistemological institution. The museum is marked by an order of knowledge and classification. And one of the, one of the major boundaries that obtained in the modern museum is the boundary between the civilized and the uncivilized, between those who required uplift and those that were on a path of cultural history and civilization. And this is a, this is a, a model of, of museum that you find in the United States, you find it in, in, in Europe. And a lot of the debates that have been taking place have been about what we call the ethnographic museum or the ethnological museum. A very peculiar kind of museum that we have very cuddly, fuzzy feelings of care about. And obviously in lurking in the background of this conversation is, is a history of disciplines and how these disciplines have reckoned with their relationship with colonialism. 
but this reckoning is of a different nature in different societies. And on the African continent, uh, ethnographic museums have been oppressive institutions. They are institutions that regulate our people as members of, of races and tribes. And they, they attend to, they, they, they depict society through the idea of the peopling of Africa based on anthropology's old ideas. Um, and so uh, this is a museum where our people do not recognize themselves. And so they've become old, faded, dusty spaces where school children are trafficked through by, by obligation and where the hardworking um, uh, curators or keepers and staff are so weighed down by the ideology of the museum that it's a, a space of conservation and a space of care. And so nothing changes because you don't touch things and you, don't, you leave them in the state that they are. And the concept of museum has such authority that it, it, it must be true, it must be correct. And so in, in, in place of that, you've got such enormously interesting new understandings of museum that have emerged in Latin America and on the African continent. Uh, the District 6 Museum in Cape Town is, is a more famous example of one such museum. But the project that is led by Chow and her colleagues on the Museum of British Colonialism, a digital project that, that has just, you know, has just intervened in the way we understand not just what colonialism, you know, what colonialism, colonialism did in, in, in uh, Kenya, but also on, on what is possible in rethinking the work of the museum. Because the old museum was a museum that did citizenship in a way where everyone was meant to know their place in the divide of the civilized and the uncivilized. What we want is a museum of critical citizenship, where people recognize themselves, where people are encouraged to, to do social criticism, where people are encouraged to, to, to question everything around them. And restitution it offers us an enormous opportunity for African societies, but also from, for the societies that were the recipients of the artifacts acquired through under conditions of violence and under colonialism's enduring violence. An oh, opportunity so that, that, that's, that's to rethink excellent. what a museum is. Okay, so, so let, me, let me ask Chow, would you like to, to comment on that or just add to that? Because I want to get uh, the other panelists as well. Uh, to comment on some of their work and how that might feed into or be in a response to what the new museum could be. Uh, absolutely. Just to add on to uh, what Siraj has said about how do you approach an how do you approach an institution that was originally designed to exclude you? You know, and there's a lot of weight with 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 coming to that space, even as a child or as whether you're working in the space or, or visiting the space. There's a lot of emotional weight and, and um, labor that we don't understand or we try and most of the time discount that really feeds into the museum experience. And I think for us, um, looking at what a new museum would look like, I think it's it's it would be a very active thinking of history as an active process, as something we do, you know, as something we we, we find there's something we go out and do not something that we receive you know which is what we were taught that we sit down in school and we learn and then we leave uh -huh. but saying actually you know history is about documentation it's about new forms of archiving it's about new representation and the museum being a space that facilitates that um encourages that and and creates that opportunity for dialogue and understanding of em empathy openness vulnerability the things that are lacking, you know, the humanity that is lacking within the space to infuse it once more and to infuse it with the, the very deliberate intention to empower those who visit the space to do something of their own in, in different capacities. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good point. So in envisioning um, for oneself the museum, let me turn to Dr. Peterson because 
the work that you've done in Uganda has actually run into some, some complications with the government, as far as I understand. Could you talk about that and um, the pushback that you, you received when wanting to open up that access, not for yourself or the West, but for Ugandans themselves to have access to that, even taking around the, the film of Idi Amin, um, the, un, you know, the unseen, the hidden doc, uh, archives. Yeah, I mean, look, as uh, Siraj knows, as Dr. Rasul knows, um, it's not only curators who are reluctant to revise museum collections and to dispense with the ethnographic criteria that by which so many collections and African institutions are set up. Ethnography is, a, among other things, a way of suppressing conflict. It's a way of making history controversy invisible, of kind of covering over trauma, of making everything seem to be about culture and tradition and ancestorship and patriarchy and consensus. All these values are upheld by the tourist industry. They're upheld by the heritage business. They're upheld by governments that wish to suppress real investment in history in the way that Chow discusses um, at the expense, in a way of effectively of, of making it possible for citizens of their country to disregard inherited traumas and to see themselves instead as faithful followers of people in power. In other words, the Ethnographic Museum is a machine not just for the, the uplifting of colonial histories, but it's also extremely potent as a means of organizing politics today in many African societies, like in Uganda, um, and like many other places in Eastern and Southern Africa. The Ethnographic Museum's longevity is not just a holdover from the colonial past, it's also a continuing vehicle for the creation of a kind of form of, of state-led political consensus. So undoing that entails, as you said, Ambassador, a great amount of political advocacy, in the Ugandan instance, we had a, a brief opening um, to put together a historical exhibition, which both Dr. Rasul and Chao Maina were able to attend happily, um, where we were able to put on display materials that invited Ugandans to look at the 1970s anew. Um, whether that opening will still be there in the future is a very difficult question to know. There's a shift in some sense in the current government's view of the past, a brief moment of openness toward historical reflection in a political order which more generally has been disposed to regard the history of Uganda as a kind of closed subject, uh, as a matter that's uh, uninteresting, unworthy of pursuit, and therefore uh, something that you know well-intentioned people ought to simply ignore or forget. Um, forgetting history, forgetting political history, as I mentioned, is an extremely useful vehicle for encouraging a kind of consensus in Uganda, as in many other places. Kenya's uh, grappling with the history of the 1950s does strike me as something that's it's, to some extent unique in Eastern and Southern Africa, actually, thinking about the work that you and your colleagues have done, Chow, in the Museum of British Colonialism. There's been a kind of convergence of legal and political will in Kenya to encourage le the pursuit of justice, historical justice for um, traumatized, violated, abused people in Mau Mau detention camps. That convergence of political interest and historical reflection strikes me as something that's quite particular about the Kenyan case, actually. Well, this is, this is an interesting um, commentary because while it um, certain kinds of histories may be politically difficult to even renounce uh, our hold on, um, but maybe Dr. Eskew and, and Dr. Conway, I think one of the differences that music maybe makes it easier in some ways because it speaks a sort of different language, but maybe I'm mistaken. I mean, we have um, at U.S. embassies, part of our cultural diplomacy is we send musicians, artists, painters, poets, I mean, you know, every phase of art uh, around the world to showcase Americanism and part of American culture, even though that culture that we are showcasing around the world um, is a mix of cultures, of course. It's, that's part of the hodgepodge of the melting pot of the United States. But does it make it easier 
not in the legal concept, but maybe easier um, with the authorization of digitization of music archives uh, versus historical, even though, of course, the music is historic as well. Well, let me um, start by addressing some of the concerns that my colleagues, my esteemed and wonderful colleagues have raised about the, the problematic past of museums in Africa and ethnography, the tool of anthropology, which is my discipline, um, very much um, part and parcel of violent histories. Um, that's certainly true. There's no denying that. Um, at the same time, anthropology has been at the forefront of trying to engage with ordinary citizens and a sort of grassroots looking upwards perspective on how people perceive their nations, their politics, their cultures. And so um, as opposed to the top down versions that historians, political scientists and others have tended to privilege. Um, so this music collection is, is unusual because it's ordinary people's voices. Yes, you do have the stars, you do have the Fela Kuti and the Babaya jazz um, recordings, but the vast majority of these recordings are of ordinary Africans producing their own musical perspectives on, on life. Um, not only that, the archive itself, one aspect of it that we didn't get to talk about is that not only is it composed of the radio shows, which, which are immense in number, and the original field recordings done by either Leo or the African sound engineers he trained at Radio Tanzania, Radio Douala, Radio Ghana. Um, it also comprises cassette recordings that listeners would send in with their fan letters. Mm -hmm. So there's this grassroots component to it as well, where people wanted their music featured on the show. They wanted to share their, their, the pride with which they, um, they wanted to promote their own culture, their own music is also a piece of this archive that has no building attached to it. It's, it's a, it, how do you deal with, with a collection that is not in the historic museums that we've been talking about in the other three contexts, but is, an, is, is a perfectly movable object, digitized object now. And to that, maybe Paul can add. Yeah, please, Paul. Right. Um, the um, I've focused more. Uh, Kelly has focused on the underlying um, uh, music that Leo collected or Leo recorded himself. Um, uh, in our partnership, my focus has been on the um, the distinctive nature of a, of an international radio broadcast, and the uh, uh, the the. Um, dissolution of borders, um, the, at least from the Voice of America's perspective, the very conscious attempt to cross borders, to cross uh, tribal uh, affinities, to cross uh, the, the notion of, of, of an emergent nation, and to, to see how music can, uh, as we use the term music diplomacy, a kind of um, um, neutral, um, we know it's not neutral, but the but the philosophy of music time in Africa and the way it played out was was to build on the neutrality of, of the shared interest of rhythm, of dance, um, of of instruments that may be called named one thing in one by one in one by one peoples and named something else, but it produces the same sound. And so this kind of, of um, community of interest in music was the was the philosophy. Of Leo and the music time in Africa, but behind that was the voice of America, making sure that America's voice, America's perspective, America's um, uh, competition with um, communist with uh, the Soviet Union, was a kind of under underlying, never overt. That's why I think what uh, what Siraj is talking about by surfacing um, the the uh, the messaging that is hidden in what seems like a benign idea of a museum or the benign idea of a, mu of a music program um, is, is worthy of, uh, it's worthy of digging deeper into the messaging and how, how juxtaposition serves as a kind of peacemaking exercise, but also a, it's a stance. It's a, it's a stance about how people should behave toward each other. And um, um, I think Leo was one of the most benign loving people we've ever encountered. But, um, but the Voice of America has its own agenda and Leo is part of that agenda um, for Music Time in Africa. So there's a lot of work that can be done on, on digging beneath the surface of what appears to be 
um, a, um, a peacemaking operation and w where it may not be quite um, quite so simple. And the, the evidence for that, I'll share real, just very quickly. The evidence for that is in the radio programs themselves. Um, the, uh, any given script is subject to um, exploration. Um, we've done a lot of work to tease out who the performers are and how they've been juxtaposed. Uh, but there's a lot of room for um, 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 exploring how, how, pro the, how these programs served as a kind of music diplomacy with, with both a, um, a, a kind of loving, caring perspective, but also a, um, a US power, uh, the US power uh, relationship as it's broadcast, um, as it's played out through Sub-Saharan Africa. So there's a, it's, it, everything is a double-edged sword and, and uh, these programs have the same um, um, power to, to serve as a political investigative tool. So this is this actually gets us back to uh, Dr. Rasul's first point of uh, democratization, and of course that was the nature of well, the Voice of America. Maybe not so much democratization, but um, at least to try to have countries not go the route of of communism. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, of course that's a political dynamic as well. So let me just ask the last question, which um, because there's a question, there are a couple of questions in the queue that I want us to get to, and I think that this will link the question that I I first saw. Um, when we talk about music being uh, kind of um, music diplomacy or shared interest through rhythm and dance, music was also very political. And a lot of songs were written to, um, to per portray or, or um, demonstrate, to illustrate a message that maybe they could not speak outwardly, um, but they could express either through a language that was unknown or not widely spoken by whoever was at the top of the political power landscape, um, be that under colonialism or even afterwards. And also when we talk about them not being, um, that the, the music was kind of shared across borders, across tribes and ethnicities, et cetera. But of course that's an artificial importation anyway of colonialism because they weren't divided beforehand. So um, I'm not sure if, to say that uh, it, it's, you know, in that sense, uh, democratization through music, um, I'm not sure that that's, I, I understand what you're saying and, and the complexities. So let me ask the question that um, is uh, in, the, um, in the queue. So coming from the second most populated African nation, this is from Ethiopia, when my father was a sixth grade student, it was 22 million. When I was the same grade, it was 42 million. Today, the conservative estimate is over 112 million. How do we scholars successfully push back the reluctance of African states and societies in convincing the urgency of museums and cultural heritage? Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to tackle that. Um, because that's a little bit difficult. Uh, maybe this could be asked alongside with what I've been thinking of is two aspects, which is the um, items, which of course, as many of you have mentioned, can include physical remains, human remains of people uh, that are in museums, um, without the knowledge or authorization of family members, et cetera. But it can also be objects that were taken, that were looted, that were stolen. What does that say about the museums of, for instance, the new museum of African and American uh, cultural heritage in Washington, DC? The power of taking it, taking ownership of the materials, but there's still the same harmful, hurtful um, objects that also enslaved 
people. Does that make a difference? Um, because is, is it rewriting the trauma? And would that convince that kind of ownership of your own um, museum make it different in terms of the repatriation or the restitution taking the power back? Does that link maybe to the uh, questioner's um, question? Go ahead, Dr. Russell. Try to address different aspects of your uh, presentation. Um, I mean, one of the problems of um, changing museums in different African societies is the model of the museum that we have tends to be a statist one. There's one that is very intimately connected into the operation of ministries of uh, arts and culture, ministries of education, ministries of science and technology, in which museum directors and curators are state employees. And sometimes they are, they, they are members of, of the state. And unfortunately, uh, statist museums are a recipe for the reproduction of museums as oppressive institutions. We need to enable, you know, African governments need to have the confidence to enable museums to be enabling environments. So, um, and, 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 and that obviously museums are going to be governed. It involves um, uh, resources, money from the state. But that doesn't mean that museums are instruments of the state, that museums are, are, um, are instruments to tell certain kinds of stories. In some ways, museums, for, for some governments, pose a kind of threat because too much democracy and too much questioning is, is, is not necessarily in everyone's interests. But I think restitution offers an enormous opportunity for renewal, for rethinking. It takes, you know, it takes a commitment by, from governments. It's going to take a commitment from uh, regional, east, west, uh, southern, and North African uh, uh, bodies. It's an opportunity for us to, to uh, enable restitution to become a platform for rethinking the relationship between museum and community. Um, and it's, it's an opportunity for us to focus on a museum as bringing together the resources and energies of activists and curators and community members and forms of knowledge that um, enter into a relationship with each other in which, as our colleague uh, Ray Silverman would put it, uh, and as some of us have argued in, in the past, creates, the, rethinks the museum as a process of knowledge making. Um, and, and in which, which requires the involvement of the broadest layer of people as possible. And that invites debate, that invites dispute. And it's, uh, you, you, this is vital. And, and states also have to realize that museums are not just institutions to showcase the society for tourists or places where school kids can go to to for, for some form of education. Museums are vital institutions for the intellectual and the cultural health of the society. Museum is central in the way in which uh, people think about themselves. And, and people must be, museums must be busy places and they must be busy on all platforms in, in real time, online, and in all these different ways that we can rethink museum, not just as a, an architecture or it's not a building, it's not just a, a collection, but that it's, it's, it's an enabling environment in which we actively dispel all the myths created by colonialism. Thank you, that's good. Let me, let me turn to Derek, uh, Dr. Peterson, and uh, then I'm just, we're going to need to start wrapping it up. No, just very briefly, I, I think I, all that Siraj has to say, it's enormously attractive. On the other hand, I just, as a historian, want to say that there's a limit to what museums can do. Repatriation, which both Chow and Siraj have pursued 
in a variety of formats is a, a tremendously valuable ethical position to take for museum curators at a point of action for uh, curators in the global south to pursue. But it is worth saying that the place where colonial governments did the work of governing African peoples was also in archives through the creation of paperwork, through bureaucracy, through the administration of the law. Paper archives in particular have apparently fallen outside the kind of museological focus on repatriation as a kind of concern, an ethical position, a project. And I do, I, I take everything that Siraj says about what museums can do, but I also would say that a vigorous uh, historical culture enabled by investments in government archives in, uh, you know, in African societies would richly uh, enable democratic dialogue in a way that I'm afraid museums um, aren't equipped to do because the whole museological format itself is a kind of a one-way uh, uh, format that, that in some sense disables the kind of disagreeable, disputatious work of holding people accountable for what they've done in the past. That's the work that can be done through legal and political investigations into archives. So um, we have sort of two last questions that I think we can combine before we close for very quick, rapid response. Um, so one question, I think these can be combined, combined. So when we talk about the movement of physical objects, what about um, the horizontal movement? So many locations where history has been made, uh, they're built upon older cultures. So who makes the decision about which layer is the one that we expose? Um, and uh, the next question that I just very quickly want uh, is, is there a role for the private sector to support the development, promotion and maintenance of museums in Africa? So what's the nexus between the museums and the business community, if at all? Um, and could this help to get us around the retain and explain rather than um, restitution approach that some um, governments, museums, et cetera, are taking. Um, let's just go quickly around uh, the panel. So I'll start with Dr. Askew because you're first on my screen. Everyone gets a quick shot of a rapid response to any or all parts of those. So in terms of the layering question, I guess that the point of discovery is to is to explore all the layers and their relationships to each other. So um, those are that's the work again of archaeologists, historians, and other scholars working on the past. Um, as for um, movement across, is that was the, was that the second one? Yeah. Um, that it's we're talking about three different kinds of institutions. One, the museum. Secondly, the archive in Africa. And then third, what we've been working with, an archive outside of Africa of African objects. But of course, uh, Dr. Russell is working on that also with the repatriation restitution work in Europe. Um, I think there are, they, they, there are three different kinds of institutions that therefore raise different kinds of questions as to how they can be repurposed and re rethought of in terms of the needs that society has today. Because I agree 100% with Dr. Rasul that creating cultural citizens who are critical is, is really um, the end goal. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, Chao, Maina, you're next on my screen. I'll just speak uh, very briefly to the question on uh, supporting museums and in, in the private se and the private sector. I think um, definitely there is a lot that can be done, but also in the sense that there are many people working on the periphery of the museum sector to support the museum sector. So such as projects such as ours, or what uh, partnerships such as Zurich are doing is supporting the museum sector, but also enabling those working on the periphery to build systems that strengthen the museum and either challenge or provide uh, access to data. So I think strengthening the museum, but also exploring what's happening on the periphery of the sector, who is interfacing with the sector and how, what support do they need could also be a, a different approach that could, could be helpful. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, Dr. Peterson. Um, I think I've said most of, much, most much of what I want to say about this, except simply to, to flag up that um, 
in a context in which we often think of digitization as a means of enabling the flow of materials across uh, spaces and enabling access and democracy, particularly here at Michigan with its investment in Google Books and such, it's worth saying that open access itself in political contexts like Uganda is deeply controversial. Um, the reason to go back to the question you asked me earlier, Ambassador Page, about why uh, researchers and students can't access the digitized archives that I've worked with in Uganda, except by going to Western Uganda to access it on a desktop computer, is quite simply that Uganda's government doesn't allow uh, government documents to leave the country for reasons that I actually find quite reasonable. That there's a kind of way in which the overlap between open access and accessibility is heralded in the global north as a means of encouraging you know, accountability, but it's also a kind of data mining. It, it, it enables the expropriation of uh, digitized assets from the global south to the global north, particularly in a context where bandwidth is expensive, hard to get hold of, where there's not the same machinery to allow access in places like Uganda or Kenya. Um, digitization is not, in fact, a path toward the democratization of knowledge or the open flow of information, those sorts of things. It, in fact, is another way, I'm afraid, in which uh, global Northerners are able to access materials to their own advantage as scholars and researchers and journalists in a way that doesn't correspondingly promote uh, the the work of people in the global South. Great. Um, I, I, Dr. Conway, add, yes. add two, two, two sentences to, on, on Derek's. Um, the profit motive of, business, of, of businesses is uh, another issue that's complicating the matters. The partnerships between private and public May get a lot of material digitized, but um, but um, uh, private partnerships may uh, uh, foster a new kind of enclosure or mm -hmm. a restriction that is not just government led, but also profit. But the profit motive drives it as well. So, it's it, it, there's there's some real advantages, but we have to be very careful about the partnerships we make. Um, Siraj, if you could be really, really brief, because um, yeah. we need to close. I mean, I, I don't think we should drive a wedge between what we call museum and what we call archive. These are collecting institutions. Archives are not just historians' institutions. They're institutions of, of, of making publics, of producing publics. And that's work that we've been doing in the South African history archives for many years. And this is about uh, rethinking, you know, archives and archivalisms as 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 projects, as as activist projects, in the same way as we we rethink what we mean by museum. These are opportunities for us with all these collecting institutions. Digitization is absolutely vital. They add to the the ways in which it, uh, to 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 access to to the government of things, but. We, we, we also need to think about ways in which these, these kinds of institutions are put to work in imagining new societies. Well, I wanna thank all of our panelists, our esteemed panelists from Kenya, from University of Michigan and from uh, South Africa. Thank you all so much for this really enlightening discussion. I encourage the audience who maybe didn't get their questions answered or answered sufficiently, please go online and look up the panelists. They have extensive writing and um, I'm sure you will uh, find great ways to, to con connect with them. So it is my pleasure at this time to give them a, a round of applause uh, virtually. And thank you all very much for all of this food for thought. So let me now um, do our final introduction, which is to turn it over to Dr. Mary Gallagher. She is the director of the International Institute here at the University of Michigan. Dr. Gallagher. And thank you, panelists.